Well, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, I praise God for saving me. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, You're 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Sister Carla, if you don't mind staying up here for just a second, just stand there. She has related to me that she's not been feeling very well. Well, praise God for the doctor's house, right? We're going to anoint her tonight in the name of Jesus. I'd like some of you ladies to maybe gather around her, and let's just pray what the Bible refers to as the prayer of faith. The Bible says this is what God responds to, and we're ex we are absolutely expecting that to happen here tonight in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch her, Lord God, heal her body, whatever's there, Lord God, that doesn't need to be there, I command it to leave in the name of Jesus. 
Your word, Lord God, says that by your stripes we are healed. And so tonight we claim that healing in the name of Jesus. By the power of your spoken word, Lord God, by the name of Jesus. Yeah, Lord God, I claim that right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, I thank you in advance, Lord. I give you praise for this instant healing that is taking place right now in Jesus' name. Yes, hallelujah, Lord God. What a mighty God we serve. Yes, what a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. And so you can be seated. Thank you very much tonight for coming, being part of our Bible study. I'm so glad that we can study God's Word. Amen. We are in the midst of, of uh, Search for Truth. We've already made it through three lessons. And tonight, I think last time we were together, which was two weeks ago, we um, actually um, uh, got started with, uh, with the... Uh, Lesson number four, and this is where we're at tonight, and this is another one. I've mentioned the fact that we've gone through lesson number one. Uh, most of the time, you can get through that one in one lesson. Maybe if you want to split that one up, that's fine. Depending on, like I said, a lot of it has to depend on who you're teaching. I mean, the Bible study fits for everybody, okay? But it's like when you go into a shoe store, sometimes, you know, they, they've got all kinds of brands and things like that, but the first thing they'll do if they don't know your size or you don't know your size is they're going to uh, measure your foot. Well, sometimes that's what we have to do when we're, when we're dealing with people. We have to measure where they're at. And God can help us to do that. I, I, I had him do it for me, reveal that first lesson. Second lesson, when you deal with creation, um, you, you're dealing with a lot of material, but again, it's, it's stuff that can be taught in one lesson. Lesson number three, as you've heard me say, should at least be split into two lessons, um, if not three. Um, and then lesson number four um, is kind of the same way. You're dealing with a lot of miles here. Um, we've actually just entered in, s in, in lesson number four, you just enter into the book of Exodus. And so it is um, um, a lot of material. It's a lot of stuff that, that, that needs to be covered. And um, again, you have to kind of size up who you're, who you're teaching. Tonight we will go into that. Sister um, Jennifer, if you don't mind... We'll go ahead and, and I'll have you go to um, lesson number four. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, perfect. And this is where we were at. I think we have the syllabus um, passed out. I think everybody has one. Everybody got four? They're $250 a copy tonight, okay? So just so you know, just make those checks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's okay. That's good. Right on them. Um, you know, a lot of times in the discipleship classes, what I encourage the students to do is get a three-ring binder and, um, and start uh, accumulating notes so that you can um, use them for reference. And that's, that's what, um, what you can think about doing. While he's getting those copies, and I have so much confidence in him, he, he really does know how to run a um, copying machine, doesn't he? I think it's his size. I think he walks up to that machine and the machine just says, I am not going to do anything tonight. This guy could pick me up and throw me right outside. <laughs> Maybe that's it, huh? Yeah. Isn't it nice to have an imagination? Yeah. You got to control that one. But while he's, do while he's getting that, again, we, we leave the book of Genesis, which has got a lot of stuff. I mean, ge the book of Genesis really does teach us a lot. And then we get into the book of Exodus, which is what we're going to talk about here tonight, possibly into some of the, of a, of the other um, books. The book of Exodus means that. It means the exit. It's when the, the, na the children of Israel or the nation of Israel exited the um, uh, Egypt, which is what they needed to do, you know, hard bondage. I don't know how many hours a day they were working, but, I mean, my goodness, that, that, that uh, Pharaoh was kind of putting, he was putting the hammer down, wasn't he? But, you know, the Lord is very patient, and one thing it teaches us is that God waited for them to cry out to the Lord. And sometimes we can be guilty of that, can't we? You know, and so we must be careful of that. The book of Leviticus, 
is that. It refers to the, Le the Levites, which uh, really a lot of what the book of Leviticus does is it teaches the holiness that God commanded in the Old Testament. The book of Leviticus will do that and how to properly approach him. And so this is very important, praise God. Uh, the book of Numbers, which is the, um, the fourth book in, in, in our, our Bible, is named that because of the fact that it twice in, in that book the nation of Israel was numbered. And then the book of Deuteronomy, which is kind of like Moses' farewell speech. This is when he basically kind of, he's, he's understanding at this point in time because of an act of disobedience, he's not going to be leading the children of Israel into the promised land. I don't know how he felt about that. I would feel pretty bad about it, but it is what it is, you know. And uh, it just kind of demonstrates to us that even the meekest man that was living at that point in time can even get a little ticked off. But nevertheless, he kind of reiterates what's going on. He kind of um, um, uh, uh, talks about it again, and, um, and we understand that, that these are very, very important books. The first five books of the... Um, of the uh, um, Bible, as we know it, of course, have to do with the law and that type of thing. So up on the screen there, what you have when we get to the book of, um, of Exodus, now again, you've got to understand the children of Israel had been in, in Egypt for, a long, for, for quite a while now, and they're populating, okay? And uh, in, uh, in order to control them, the Pharaoh issued a very, very stringent plan. You know, they were to be put to work. And then he was going to initiate birth control, unfortunately, and that's what it was. But thank God for the fear of the Lord. And that's what the Bible says, that the midwives feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. And that wasn't just an easy thing, you know, but the bottom line, they did. And so the nation of Israel began to grow in leaps and in bounds, and this is what was surrounding the birth of Moses. Amen. It wasn't the best of times. It was a challenging time. But uh, the Bible refers to the fact that his mother and father saw that he was a goodly child. They saw something there. And so they took it upon themselves to hide this child. You know what the story is. Anybody ever heard the story of Moses? It's kind of a neat story, isn't it? Where they took him down to the river and put him in a little homemade uh, like ark type of thing. And, and, and then his sister Miriam was supposed to keep an eye on him. And of course, one day he just decided to start crying and the daughter of Pharaoh happened to be there. Remember that? And uh, those maternal instincts kind of kicked in. And she basically heard that child and, and had that child brought to her. And I don't know if it was instantaneous. I got a feeling it was right away, though. She said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise this child. And, of course, Mir Miriam heard that. She saw or uh, was there observing. And she came and she said, listen, you're going to need somebody to nurse the child. Well, I just happened to know somebody. Yeah, isn't that something? Just happened to know somebody. And so the mother of Moses ended up being in the house of Pharaoh with, um, with Moses and, um, and basically raised him. Now, we don't have a lot of information about those early years, but we can assume, again, and I don't think it's, so, it's, it's bad to assume, that she was raising him and making sure that child knew exactly who, she, who he was. Amen. And so I thank God for the home. Praise God. In Moses' life, what you got is you got three 340 year periods. That's what you have in Moses' life. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he spent in the house of Pharaoh. You know, they, they believed all kinds of weird stuff. You know what the Egyptians believed? They believed that life, that the Nile River was the beginning of life. And I think it was in the springtime the Nile River would, would exceed its banks, and then when it receded, it would leave this silt kind of material, and these worms would kind of appear. And that's where the Egyptians believed that life began. Now, again, we assume that Moses was probably taught that. Now, did he believe it? No, I don't think he did. Because when he came to a certain age, he said, man, I know who the one true God is. And he began to pursue them. So the first 40 years of Moses' life he spent in the courts of Pharaoh. The second 40-year period of Moses, he, he begins, and I, I like this process of God. Before he became the leader of Egypt, or leader of, of Israel, he became a shepherd. And I think that's important. I think that's of God. The neat thing about Moses' life is he's like us sometimes. He gets ahead of the program. He knew that these children needed to be delivered, and so he was going to take it upon his own hand to do that. Remember what he did? 
He saw there was an abuse being done with the nation of Israel. And so what did he do? Does anybody remember? He killed that Egyptian, didn't he? Buried him in the sand, you know. But that word got around, and of course, that's what led to the exodus of Moses from that country because word got around that he did that, and somebody was looking for him named Pharaoh, okay? And so the second 40-year period of Moses' life, he spends in the wilderness on the backside of Sinai, you know? And, um, of course, that's where he had his encounter with God. That's where he saw the bush that was consumed with a flame, or I should say was on fire, but it wasn't consuming the bush. What a sight. Amen. I don't know how far away Moses was, but he was a ways away. And he saw that, and he was attracted to that phenomena, praise God. I tell people all the time that they have a hard time with the oneness versus the Trinity. I said, do we take the burning bush, and do we make that into a God? No, we don't. That's an appearance. That God makes an appearance. He manifests himself in many ways. And, of course, we understand that he manifested himself that way. And so he gave a message to Moses towards his 40-year end of his being a shepherd. And then the last 40-year period of Moses' life, this is when God used him to deliver the nation of Israel from, from, from terrible bondage in, um, in Egypt. It's an interesting life, isn't it? Very interesting life. He got married, and of course he's, he has a couple of children and, um, and all of that kind of business. And even somebody like Moses can begin to make excuses because when you start studying his life, that's one of the first things that he did. You know, when God says, I'm going to send you down there. See, Moses became the official um, mailman from God. See, Moses isn't the deliverer. We all the time say that. God is the deliverer. Never forget that, folks. Sometimes we get operating in the gifts of the Spirit or we get God will do something through us, that type of thing. But never forget, we're not the ones that do it. All we're doing is becoming channels for God to do it through. Can you say amen? Folks, you wouldn't believe how, how, how many people mistake that. Pretty soon they start thinking, well, that's me. I've got a, a, you know, a corner on this market, and that is not true. So Moses was the mailman. He was the one that came down, praise God, that said to, to Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. And it was a simple message. It wasn't like he demanding, you know, 40 years of back pay. You know, it wasn't like he was saying, listen, you know, I want you to load up all the carts because when we leave, we want to leave with all this stuff. No, all he was just saying is let my people go. Amen. And so Pharaoh had a problem with that. Do you remember the, um, um, uh, the encounter that he had? What was, one of, what was the response that Pharaoh had when Moses came in and said, Lord Jehovah says, let my people go. Remember what he said? Yeah, who is this? Because you've got to understand that in, 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 in the, 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 um, the vast majority of cultures, they serve multitudes of gods. They make gods out of everything. And believe me, today they're doing the same thing. They're sports people that pretty soon become gods. There's entertainers that, boy, we want, we want to get your, your, your take on this. Folks, I'm telling you the truth. And this is what we have in our culture, you know. The one true God, praise God, is the one that people need to see. And that's the one that we need to be constantly referring to them of. But on this first page here, what you do is you got a lot of a lot of uh, a mileage is taken care of here because, of course, in the book of Exodus, this is where they're going to move into a place where God wants him. He wants them back in the promised land, doesn't he? And so what we see is we see the institution of, of plagues. And if you study these plagues, you're going to find out that these plagues weren't just something that God just kind of, you know, drew out of the sky, that kind of thing. No, these plagues are gods. Literally, these are, these are things that Egypt had made gods to. And so this is why it's important here that we, that we understand that. A lot of people that you're going to be teaching, now listen to me, I'm going to say something extremely revealing here. You know, they're not going to tell you this, but they have, con uh, they have confidence, they and the people that you're going to be teaching have confidence and faith in a lot of things. And you might just encounter them at a time when God is going to begin to tear that down in their life. That's why you've got to have patience. There's a lot of people that depend more and have more faith in the economy than they do in God. 
Now, I'm telling you the truth. See, we look at these stories sometimes and we think, oh, well, that stuff doesn't happen anymore here. Listen, folks, it's like a lot of things. It's just taken on a whole different, um, uh, you know, manifestation. But it's basically the same thing being recycled. The problem with mankind is that they're not coming to God for their help. And then when they do come to God, a lot of times they're not really ready because they want to bargain like Pharaoh did. Remember that? In these, fa in, the, in these plagues, how Pharaoh would say, well, you just take this group, or you just take that group, or this one can't go. See, he was bargaining with them. And you've got to understand, when it comes to the kingdom of darkness, a lot of times when, when he sees somebody wanting to make a move towards God, the bargaining chips will come out. And this is why, you know, sometimes you've got you to gotta be there for, for, for the whole thing, praise God. That's why I'm telling you, this Bible study is designed for you to get in someone's home and to stay there for quite a while. It's not an hour Bible study. It's not designed that. Now, if you want to teach that kind of Bible study and if you feel like the people that you're, you're dealing with need a Bible study like that, I wouldn't try to teach a Bible study like this. I would go to something that we have. We have several of them. There are several of Bible studies that you can teach within an hour that will introduce people to the Holy Ghost, that will introduce people to repentance, that will introduce people to Jesus' name baptism. And if that's the direction you feel God wants you to go, then do it. But this Bible study here, folks, don't make any pretenses about it. It's a Bible study that's designed to help people get through the Bible in its entirety, praise God, and to begin to see some things in their own lives. Can you say amen? That's why, again, sometimes we get frustrated when we try to do something that really, you know, that, that's, that's, that's not, it's not really the right tool. Okay, now back to the plagues. Again, you know, systematically, you got the Nile River turned to blood. You got the frogs that came on the heels of that. Remember that? And uh, the frog god was a big god. It was. Amen. And you must understand, these first two plagues, the magicians were able to, um, um, uh, now I'm not going to say duplicate it. They were able to, um, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the devil likes to imitate. See, that's what they were doing, you know. Do you remember when, when Moses first encountered Pharaoh? Remember what he did? Threw down his, stra his staff, and you remember the staff turned into a, into a serpent, you know? Well, the, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to come up and, 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 and imitate the same thing. But there was just one, one, one problem, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the, the serpent of, of Moses or of God, his representative, was able to devour them. Amen, you know? I mean, you talk about a thick-headed person. Pharaoh was a thick, I mean, my goodness, I don't know. I mean, systematically, God was tearing down his gods and helping him to see the real God. And boy, I mean to tell you, you know, um, uh, that was a tragedy that he did not. A lot of people lost their lives because of that. And in today's world, we have similar things. We have cultures and we have countries that have, for whatever reason, got hard-headed towards God. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are, are, are put in harm's way. Amen. But aren't you glad that you found who the one true real God is? Come on, aren't you glad? Don't ever go a day without thanking the Lord for knowing who he is in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, folks, that is absolutely important in Jesus' name. And so systematically, we go through these, these um, uh, plagues. And uh, the third one, which was the gnats or the, or the lice is what one, one um, uh, rendition is, is that do you remember what happened where Moses took his staff and stirred up the dust? That was where he left those magicians. They were not able to do that. And I kind of like to use the adage that, that uh, Moses left them in the dust. Yeah. There are some things that the devil can, and for whatever reason God is allowing him to, to imitate. But listen to me, folks, real, real straight here. There are a lot of things that he can't even touch. He cannot produce grace. He cannot produce real peace. He cannot produce forgiveness. He cannot produce real remission of sins. I'm telling you, folks, we got the goods because God has given them to us. And these are the things that people need to see, praise God. Religion can't do this. It can't. Praise God. And I'm not in any competition with them. I'm here to tell you that God gives us truth so that we can reveal truth to people. 
Amen. And in this, this episode right here, that's exactly what God was doing. He was tearing down those gods, not because he was mad at the Egyptians. He was tearing them down so that they could see in their own eyes that these false gods that they were worshiping are nothing more than a bunch of symbols, praise God. And you've got to understand, you know, people that you're teaching might not have 100 or 200 gods in their life, but they've got a couple of them that need to be tore down. And God will help you to see that. And once those gods are tore down and they'll begin to accept the one true God, then you're going to begin to feel a flow, praise God, when you begin to teach. Come on, you need to understand that. You don't have to go to 10 years. Bible college to feel this. All you have to do is be willing to be used of the Lord, and the anointing of the Lord will come upon you, and if you'll just speak the words of truth, you don't have to have the Bible memorized, but if you'll just go through this script and you'll begin to teach people with sincerity, you're going to feel a flow that will come from you into them. And I'm going to tell you something, don't be surprised if people in one of these Bible studies lift up their hands and they begin to praise God, and all of a sudden they begin to speak with another tongue that they never had before. I'm telling you the truth, folks. That's what this kind of stuff can do. Amen. But before that can happen, sometimes things have to be tore down. And this is what God demonstrated to us by this episode. But we understand that God knew exactly where he was going, and he went to the first, what we would call the feast, and this was the Passover. Amen. You've got to understand, God is always giving people an opportunity to avoid his judgment. Always. But you've got to follow his rules. Amen. Remember when we talked about Noah? That boat was built with the idea that people could get on board. But unfortunately, people didn't take God up on it. Now, I don't want to belabor that, but it's the truth, folks. You just, you've got you to present that with that idea that anybody can get saved, praise God. Well, you've got to understand that that last instruction that God gave to them, which is, a, which is a very, very, very important idea. He told them to get a lamb, didn't he? Remember that? He told them to shed that blood, and where were, where were they supposed to put that blood? Yes, not on the roof, not on the windows. Not some concoction that they had. You've got to understand, one of the reasons why people um, uh, um, find favor with God is because they believe him at his word. And we've got to begin, uh, believe me, well, as you're teaching this Bible study, you've got to begin to sow that seed. That if you'll begin to obey God's word, you will find his favor and you will see some things happen. So they put that blood on the doorpost, didn't they? Praise God. And the reason for that is because the death angel was going to pass over, right? Amen. And so this was a feast that God, that God uh, uh, shared with them, and this is what they did. But it's interesting, my friend, because you've got to understand that Jesus is referred to as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, right? Well, you've got to understand that that lamb was designed to be roasted, and then they were to consume every bit of it. Ah, I'm not talking about just the filet mignon here. Now that's, you see, there's another thing that we lose, that God said, I want it all consumed. Amen. Well, that's, that's a perfect type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Do you remember one of his teachings in the sixth chapter of the book of John? You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. What was he talking about there? He was talking in direct um, response to what was happening here. You've got to understand that God has laid down the way it's supposed to be. And some people lose track of the fact that they think they can kind of pick and choose God. And a lot of the people that you are going to teach, that's the kind of thinking they have. They've been told that you can come to God like you go to McDonald's, and you can just pick anything that you like, and the rest, you know, you can just kind of go to the wayside. Listen to me, folks. That's where most people are at in religious movements. But you and I understand that that's not what God is dealing with. God is dealing with his word and with his truth, and you and I must get to a place where we can consume all of the truth of God. Praise God. Listen to me, folks. If you do a study of denominations, you're going to find a a lot of them at the first, uh, at around the year 1900 to about 1930, a lot of those groups came through the truth, and they saw the truth. But the problem of it is they sold it out for a bunch of cheap junk. And you're one of these people, praise God, that aren't selling it out. Can you say amen? And this is what you're presenting to people, praise God. So that Passover feast is a very, very important feast, praise God, because God said what he meant, and he meant what he said. 
And this was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, wasn't it? This was the one that finally, um, you know, um, uh, Pharaoh, he finally relented and said, man, get him out of here. You know, just get him out of here. But we knew that the story wasn't over there either, was it? But that's what you got here on this first page. I know I've kind of spent a little bit of time here, but God sends a deliverer, praise God. And you must understand that's why you're going to those people's houses, is that God is sending a deliverer, praise God, into that house. And if they'll listen and they'll take it serious, praise God, you're going to find miracle after miracle that will happen. Because I'm going to tell you something, only God can perform the real true blue miracles in Jesus' name. Isn't that, isn't that neat? I tell you, I'm so glad, praise God, that we can know these things in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, let's go to, uh, first of all, maybe I should slow down here a little bit. Is there any questions about this chart here up here? All I did was just teach off the chart. That's all I did. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to understand something. The illustration that I use, and that's a good question, the illustration that I use is, uh, and, and let me just give you the, the back part first, it was because of the condition of his heart. And, and it's got to do with the fact that on, a, on a, sun, a, a July afternoon, you can take a picnic table, and you can, um, you can take a clump of clay, and you can take a, a, a pound of butter or half a pound of butter and put it on the same table, same time, and what is the, 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 what is the effect of that on the, on the sun? It melts one and it hardens the other. Well, the, what is the, why is that? It's because of the condition of the material. And God hardened his heart because his heart was, was already hardened. It wasn't receiving the things of God. And so you must understand, God comes to us with truth. And the truth would be the illustration of the sun. And that sun isn't going to change. And that's why the condition of our heart has to change. Because if it doesn't, the truth of God's word will begin to harden our heart. Now, do you know how you get your heart so softened? Does anybody know how to do that in the New Testament? Because that's a good question. Through repentance. That's why John the Baptist came onto the scene approximately six months before Jesus did. Because he was establishing that message good message of repentance. Amen. You talk about in the Old Testament, and we'll deal with this a little bit later, but you talk about the circumcision that took place. Remember that? We talked a little bit about that. Well, we understand that circumcision in the flesh isn't what we're looking for, but we understand that circumcision of the heart is what changes the condition of the heart. And so the answer is, is that God's truth or his presence harden people's hearts because of the condition that was in. See, God gave Pharaoh the opportunity and everybody else in Egypt the opportunity to repent. Because you've got to understand, when they came out of Egypt, um, there was a mixed multitude with them. Sure there was. There were some Egyptians that got on the bandwagon. But the only way that they could be saved was they had to get into the household of an Israeli. And so you've got to understand, God always puts the plan, but unfortunately, people's hearts get, get, get hardened. Is, did that help? Okay, okay. Anyone else have any other questions about that? That's good. Praise God. And that's why, again, it's, isn't it neat to see somebody's heart? Amen. And I've seen it many, 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 many times. Praise God. People who were hardened to the things of God. And then all of a sudden, because of some circumstance, all of a sudden they will be open to it. By the way, you're looking at one. I was extremely hard-nosed against Jesus' name baptism for an entire year. But God never gave up on me. And he began to help my heart to get soft. And I'm going to tell you, by the time we got done or God got done with that project, you could, I couldn't wait from Thursday to Sunday to get baptized. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. That's what a, a, a well-conditioned heart will do, is you won't have to beg people to do stuff. You won't have to explain it to them 55 times. People will be ready, and they'll want to do it. And the case was myself. 
I was hardened to Jesus' name baptism for almost a year. But when God began to deal with me on a Tuesday night, I, I, I tried to get him to baptize me that next morning, praise God. I'm telling you the truth. This is what, you be, this is what I live for, praise God, is when people's hearts will get ready for the things of God. Amen. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Warren? Well, the problem with that, Warren, and that's what you're saying is, is good, but it's not exactly the, the entire package, is that the problem with the Jews is they emphasize the law above grace. And that's what their downfall was. They were believing that by the law they would be saved. And the law was never designed to save us. Do you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't, he wasn't telling them not to do the law. The problem is, is the Jews came around and said, you have to do the law to be saved. And we understand that's an impossibility. Because Paul said, if you mess up in one area of the law, you've messed it all up. And so we're not doing away from the law. We're just saying, listen, the law was just basically a teacher. It taught us how really far behind we were. And so what the Jews are doing, and a lot of in my opinion, sometimes very conservative Pentecostals will put their lifestyles above grace. And we cannot do that because we are saved by grace. Now, we understand that works comes after that, not before it. And so this is a little bit of what you see in the book of Galatians. Is that enough of an explanation for right now? Because we will deal with that a little bit later. That's a good, good question. Anyone else? Amen, amen. I thank God for it. Okay, well, if, if not any other questions, let's go to chart number two here, and this is where Israel begins their journey. And on this page here, what you have is you have an overview, an overview of what's some of the events that happened, um, you know, to them. And you've got to understand the design of God was for them to only remain in the wilderness for just a few months. It wasn't the design of God for them to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. It was the design of God for them to, first of all, go to a place called Sinai. And does anybody remember what they got at Sinai? They got the law. You got millions of people living together. You better have some laws. And so this is where the first stop off was. I, I'm, I'll, I'll go through this here in just a second. But that's where, that's where God designed for them to take a little bit of a hiatus to get the law. But for, from, from, from Sinai, they were to go right into the, into, the, um, um, into the promised land. But we understand what doubt and unbelief will do. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, 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 and take this chart chronologically, okay? And the first one up there on the left hand, my left-hand side, I don't know if it's yours or not, but on the left-hand side up there onto the top, what you have is the first place that God brought them was to a place of crossing. This was the Red Sea. Remember that? And remember what I told you, that, hardened, that Pharaoh's heart was so hardened that he got upset and he got 600 of his best warriors and he said, we're going to go after them and we're going to bring them back. Well, in that day, folks, that was the best army there was in the world. It was. And God was going to show to the nation of Israel that he's able to take care of the best army in the world, literally. But you remember what the event was? God purposely led them to a place where without his help they weren't going to get across and remember when they saw the dust, you know, coming behind them? And you remember what their response was? Now, I'm not talking about Egypt. I'm talking about the Israelis. You remember what their response was? Oh, God, you brought us out here to die. Isn't that amazing? You know? But, I mean, this is where we're at. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. This is what we've got to work on. 
we got to work on getting that doubt out of our lives and quit doubting God and quit believing that God is just trying to make, make a spectacle out of us. No, God is trying to deliver us and put us on a journey, praise God, that will give us real peace and give us real direction in life in Jesus' name. And so when they got to that sea there, the Red Sea, you know, of course, God had a pillar of fire that was behind them, praise God. And, and the Bible teaches us that Moses stood up, and he was the spokesman. And remember what he said? He said, stand still. And what did he tell them they were going to see? Oh, come on, you guys need to read this more often. He said, you're going to see the salvation of God. Amen. And the Scripture teaches us that the east wind began to blow. Oh, I teach a whole lesson on the east and the west and the south and the north winds. They all have significance. They really do. Well, the east wind, praise God, began to, begin to, to blow, praise God. And when they got up that next morning or when daylight came, you've got to understand, man, all they had to do is get up and open their eyes. And what did they see? They saw the plan of escape, didn't they? Isn't that cool? I'm going to tell you something, folks. Listen to me. I'm going to say something again that I think is very important. The longer I live for God and the closer I stay to Him, now listen to me, longer, closer. Why don't you do that with me? Longer, closer. Two things, okay? The more obvious the things of God are. That's why you got to keep doing this. You got to get closer, not further away. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. The longer you do this, the closer you get to God, the more obvious the things of God will be. Come on, folks, can you tell me that anybody would have missed where God wanted them to go that morning? Absolutely not. And this is what I'm talking about, praise God. Get rid of the junk out of your life by getting closer to God. And that's what will squeeze everything else out. Sometimes we want to sit there and we want to, we want to get the checklist out and tell everybody about everything that they can't do. You ever done that? Sure we do, because that's the way we are. But you've got to understand, start emphasizing right with this Bible study the stuff that people can do that will bring them closer to Him. And then watch the miracles happen. Do you feel the anointing of God in this place right now? You see, this is the same anointing of God that could be at your kitchen table the next time when you're teaching somebody. I'm telling you the truth, praise God. And people can begin to feel that. And I'm going to tell you what you do is you begin to restore hope right in that house. And so this is what God is doing. And so he, he gave them the way of escape, and then you remember what happened when they got over to the other side. Those chariots went after them. God strategically allowed that fire, that pillar of fire, to disappear, and they went after them, praise God. You remember the first thing that he did when they got into the midst of the Red Sea? No, he didn't do that first. What did he do first? He had some angel there with a lug wrench. No, I'm just kidding. But those wheels fell off. Those chariots became inoperable. Then, you're right, that's what happened. Then he brought those waters in. And that army in one couple of swift movements was taken care of just like that. In fact, it was such a, must have been such a sight that when they got on the other side, Miriam, who was Moses' older sister, remember the one that was keeping an eye on her, on him? She began to sing. I'm telling you something, folks. I love songs that are inspired by God. I believe that must have been quite a tune that, she was, that she, was, she was singing, praise God. And that's what I'm saying. A lot of times what you're going to see, and this is what's the instruction of Moses, a lot of times so that they wouldn't forget some things, God would give them a song. He would. And so it's, it's just the way it is. Music has a way of reinforcing some things. And I like it, praise God, especially when you sing to the Lord. So that was one of their first, that was their first stop off. God was going to prove to them how, how powerful he was. Amen. And then the next stop that you see is, of course, you've got to understand, we're talking millions of people here, you know. They don't have train loads of cargo going with them. And so God's going to prove to them that he can supply a table, is what the Bible says in the book of Psalms. He literally supplied a, 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 a food table right there in the wilderness. Every day he would do that. 
But mo something that's actually even more important than food to begin with is water. And they got to that place where the bitter waters were there. They didn't want to drink the stuff, you know. And so do you remember what God told Moses to do? Yes, he took a certain tree and he was to cast it into that water, praise God. Amen. And those bitter waters turn sweet. Come on, next time you get some bitter waters in your life, why don't you ask the Lord to, to help you to stay there until those waters turn to sweetness, praise God. I'm telling you, it can happen. And what a testimony in Jesus' name. And then, of course, we see the third area there where God is beginning to supply them food, and he did that, you know. I forget, I heard an account, I, had, I have it written down someplace in my, in my library, but how many car loads, train car loads of food, and how many gallons of water they would have to have every day. You ever done a study like that? You should. It's phenomenal what God was doing. Listen to me, Tim. Every day he was showing them. I'm not talking about twice a month. Come on, folks. Why don't people want to come to church? I, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. Praise. I just feel like preaching. I do, Kevin. I feel like preaching every time I teach this Bible study. Praise God. Because it irritates me sometimes, not as much as it used to. Why don't people want to come to church? Why don't they want to come to the prayer room? Why don't they want to open up their Bibles? Come on, they're cheating themselves out of meals that God will supply for them every day of their life. Praise God. This shouldn't be a burden. We should, after a while, we should learn to put away some of this other stuff that isn't going to mean nothing in 10 years. And we should start putting in the stuff that's going to take us to eternity. Come on, this is what God is trying to help us to understand. And he proved this to those Israelites. He proved to them that every day he was going to take care of them. But you know one of the problems they had, especially in the book of Numbers, is they began to murmur, they began to complain. And listen to me, folks, that didn't end with the New Testament. We're guilty of that a lot is that we don't realize what God is doing for us every day. And this is what he wants to show you. And then you can go into somebody's kitchen or living room or wherever it is. I was at a county jail today teaching this kind of stuff. You can go everywhere, anywhere teaching this stuff. But listen to me, you want to know what really makes this word, uh, you know, uh, valuable? Is someone who has a testimony of what it's done. That's why he's, he's busy wanting to do that with your life every day. He's trying to help you to understand, just like the children of Israel. He'll get you through the Red Sea. He'll turn those bitter waters into sweet. He'll give you some manna from heaven, praise God, that you've never had before. I'm telling you the truth. This is what God will do. And he, and he needs to do this for us because when we go and begin to talk to people that haven't got a clue, praise God, I'm going to tell you one of the greatest things that you can have is an eyewitness. Come on, can somebody testify how good God is? Come on, we talked about it Sunday night, didn't we? Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. And so this little trail helps us to understand that's what God was doing. And then he brought them to a place called Mount Sinai. Now, I understand there's a little discrepancy about exactly where that was and, and exactly where the crossing was and all that kind of business. You know, folks, that's kind of like the creation week. I don't really get into that because I don't know. I don't, I've never lived over in that part of the country. I don't have the exact place where God crossed and that type of thing. All I know is the Bible says they did. That's good enough for me, so I make a deal out of that. Don't try to prove stuff that you can't. You'll get yourself, man, your wheels will really start spinning then. And then don't get yourself too deep. Just keep it light. Let them go deep, and then you, then you can begin to follow the lead of God. But Mount Sinai is very, very important, praise God. God created a boundary. You've got to understand, he created a boundary around those mountains. And those people were pretty smart because that must have been quite a deal to see that smoke come down on that mountain. And all of a sudden, the Bible says they heard a trumpet sound and things begin to shake. I'm telling you something. The fear of the Lord is a real thing. And God was trying to emphasize that that's where they were. And so we understand that the book of Exodus primarily deals with that too. I think it's around chapter number 24 where Moses goes up the first time and then in, in chapter 34. He goes back up again, 
and we've talked about that. Moses even had a little fit, didn't he? Took those, took those um, tablets that God had hewed out and threw them on the ground, which was disrespect. I don't care what anybody says. I know Moses was a good guy, but, you know, he wasn't supposed to do that. And the next time he was to, to hew out those stones, guess what? God said, okay, you get your little hammer and you get your pick out, and we'll just see how this works. Listen to me, folks. I'd much rather have the finger of God. Come on, I'd rather have the finger of God do some things in my life. And I know that you would too. And you know something? He wants to. This is what we've got to allow him to do, praise God. You know, even the magicians of Egypt said that. Did you know that? Remember when they got left in the dust? They had to go back and explain that to Pharaoh. You know? And what did they call it? They said, this is nothing but the finger of God. Yeah, that's what it was. You know, even unbelievers can get it sometimes. And so we must do the same thing, praise God. Is this okay the way I'm doing this tonight? Are you getting anything? Are you right? I know she writes a book. My goodness, she's going to be publishing probably three books here by the time we get done with this study. I like that, though. I do appreciate that. But the rest of you, yeah, write some things down and let God check some things out for you in Jesus' name. Then finally, they came to a place, or not finally, but they came to a place called Kadesh Barnea. What well, quite a name, right? That's not like Buffalo and Sundance and Wright, you know, and that type of thing. But this was a place. And what this was, this was a place where God was going to have them settle for just a real short time, and he was going to have them to go over into the promised land. Do you remember the situation where 12 spies were, ta were, 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 were picked, you know, one from each tribe, and he sent them in there? Do you, remember the two, do you remember the two that came back and said they could do it? Do you remember those two? Joshua and Caleb, we remember that, don't we? Can you name any of those spies that didn't? Yeah. That's right up there with who won the 2005 World Series, isn't it? Nobody knows that one, you know. But the bottom line is, folks, that's the truth. How soon we forget those that forget. I'd rather be in the league with the ones that say you can do it. And listen to me, just I know you know this already, but I'll just mention it to you. They weren't in the majority. No, they weren't. And so this is what sometimes we look for, and sometimes that's not what God looks for. He just looks for belief, praise God. They went into that land, and they saw all kinds of good stuff. Bible talks about the fact that they had a stave between two guys, and they, were t they took a cluster of grapes. I was thinking about that today. I had grapes for lunch, you know, but not a cluster like that. So the, the, the land literally flowed with milk and honey. It was a beautiful place that God had for them. The only thing they didn't get, and sometimes we don't get, and we covered it not this last Sunday, but the Sunday before. Do you remember what the lesson was on two weeks ago, or I guess a week ago last Sunday? What did we talk about? Seven times in the book of Revelation. He that, don't forget that, folks. See, this is what a lot of people do forget. They think that God's just going to open the door wide and say, well, here, just have at it. All your enemies are going to fall down and bow down, and just they're not going to even bother you. That's, that's nonsense. That's what gets people into trouble. And so they knew, and that's where Joshua and Caleb came in. They knew that the land had to be conquered. But they're thinking back and going, the greatest army in the world was Egypt. And I saw it with my own eyes. One swoop of that water, man, and they were gone. Now, you're going to tell me that God's going to have a problem in the promised land just because people are a little bigger there? No, I don't either. See, that's what we got to realize. And this is what you're sowing the seed of in people's lives. You're not telling them that everything is going to be great when they come into the kingdom of God. I hope you're not telling them that because, boy, they're going to get hugely disappointed. You're just telling them that you're hooking up with someone who can help you overcome anything. I don't care what it is in life. I don't care how long it's been there. You can go back six or eight generations if you want to, but you're serving Almighty God who can break that chain. He can come into your life right now, and he can make a difference in the name of Jesus. Come on, can you feel the intensity of that? That's what this Bible study is all about. It's just bringing back the facts, praise God, that God was there, and and he can do it in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. 
Praise God. And so then you got the last thing that's on this chart anyway, is that you have that brazen serpent. And that was a time in, in the book of Numbers. That's what I'm telling you. The book of Numbers is a very sobering book. It really is. I mean, God got a little fed up with people. And they begin to complain. And the Bible says that God sent a judgment to them. Fiery serpents. How would you like to do that? Would you like that in here some night when people aren't worshiping God and you're sitting there folding your hands and saying, I dare you, preacher? How would you like him to let loose some fiery? No, he doesn't do that. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying, but that's what happened. Those people begin to complain. And you want to know why they were complaining? Check it out for yourself in the book of Numbers. The Bible says the journey was hard. Now, there's another one of those realities that we must understand that some days living for God, it's going to be a little bit hard. It's going to be uphill. It's going to take some effort. We're living in a culture today that doesn't want that. And you won't find that in the Bible. Come on, I, I preached a, a, an ordination service up there Friday, and one of the, the, the places I used was where Paul changed his theology. You know where Paul changed a little bit of his theology? You find it in the 14th chapter of the book of Acts. That was right after he got stoned. Right after he got back up and went out of, the, out, out of the place where he was. You know what the Bible says? It says that he changed a little bit. He said, through much tribulation, we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. That doesn't sound like easy street to me, folks. Now listen, I'm using a lot of liberty here with you guys. I would, I would back that one down way, way, way much if I was teaching new converts. But the bottom line is, folks, I try to be as real as I can. I try to help them to understand that you can have all the help you want from God. But praise God, you're going to encounter some things. But even encountering some things, you're going to see some things that God can do like you have never seen before in the name of Jesus. And listen to me, folks. Get into the habit like I have. If he can do it one time, he can do it twice. If he's done it twice, he can do it three times. If he does it three times, he can do it four. I'm telling you, folks, you're not going to encounter anything that you and God can't handle. But you just got to get to a place where you realize that the Old Testament, as described by 1 Corinthians 10, is our schoolmaster. It's, it's written so for our admonition. It's written so you and I would have some examples of how God does it. And so this is what he does. And so that brazen serpent was one of those times when those fiery serpents came and people were dying. It must have been a tough thing. But God, again, in his mercy, comes through, and he gives Moses the instruction. Remember that? He says, construct. And I don't think he did that in five minutes. I think it might have taken him a little while to make that brazen serpent. If I know anything about metals, folks, I don't think it was just laying there by the tree, and he said, just pick it up and put it on the post. No, he said, construct it, make it. So it probably took him a little while to do it. But he said the instruction was put it up on that pole and that the people will gaze into that, praise God, I will heal them. And I believe that God will do that from time to time. And you want to know why I think he does that? Is that sometimes the Bible uses the term in the book of Romans. It says the goodness and the severity of God. There's times when God will come in and he knows when. I don't. 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 I, I, folks, I, that's not my area. But God sometimes will do some cutting off. And you can, you can lay to rest, folks, that if somebody gets cut off from God, that God has made every effort to try to make them part of this. But there comes a time when things have just got to say, wait a minute here, this is either God or it isn't. And in the book of Numbers, it was one of those times when God said, okay, folks, this is what it is. You know, I think of another time like this in the book of Acts, chapter number 5. The Bible says things were humming along pretty good, but people started holding out. Remember two of them that held out? Ananias and Sapphira, didn't they? They wanted to join themselves to that elite group. And the Bible says they started keeping back from God. And the Bible says the judgment of God came on them. You can't explain it any other way. And I'm not making light of it, but they fell down dead. And the Bible says that after that, and study it for yourself, the fifth chapter, great fear came upon the church. And the Bible says that they durst not to, 
to join themselves to them. If you really do a thorough study on that, you're going to find out they were talking about the ministry there. They were talking about that God was placing a boundary between what I call the laity and the ministry. See, it's like anything, just like in America. Everybody wants to be the chief. And that is an impossibility, and that is confusion. God has always had God-ordained leadership. And sometimes when people don't, don't do it exactly like they do, they want to become the leadership. And if they're not God-called, folks, that is called a disaster. That's what it's called. And listen, I'm not in charge of that. God is. And at that fifth chapter of the book of Acts, there was a very pivotal time. Amen. God was showing special miracles through these guys. I don't see where Jesus ever did it. I'm not saying he didn't. But I don't see anywhere in the scripture where he ever did or the shadow. The shadow of Peter came over people and they were healed just like that. That's powerful, folks. That's powerful. But we must understand along with that will sometimes come the judgment of God where the goodness and the severity of God will be shown. And God says, it's time to get the nonsense out of the house. It's time to get the lukewarm off the fence. It's time to get people who really want to serve me to start doing it instead of this beating around the bush and, and, and in and out type of thing. And believe me, folks, I see that not only in a church, a local church like this. I've seen it many, many times since I've pastored this church. But I also see it in individuals' lives where people are called upon, you need to make a decision. Either I am God or I'm not. And I know that, I'm, that sounds simple, and I understand that that can be a very, very tough journey for people to go. But listen, folks, it's God's way. And that's what he did with this group here. And so these, I just hit two, two charts there. One is, of course, the first one that dealt with Moses and had to deal with his, his what I call, three 40-year periods. And, and then they're very interesting. The character studies that the Bible has, it doesn't have a lot of them, but the ones that it does are very, very thorough. You can study them, and you can get so much out of that word. It really can. And the important thing is, is that it'll begin to shine a little bit on your life. You can see a little bit of Moses in your life. You can see a little bit of Abraham in your life. You can see a little bit of Jacob in your life. You begin to see a little bit of Joseph in your life. Anybody ever been persecuted? Anybody ever been treated badly by your brethren? Yeah. We identify with these things. And that's why when, once you start realizing the story, it's easy to tell because it's, it's deja vu. It's happening all over again. And that's what the Bible helps us to understand, that there is no new thing under the sun. No new thing in Jesus' name. Okay, let's stop here. Is there any questions about these things that we've talked about here? I know this is um, a quite a bit of stuff that we've talked about here. Unfortunately, let me just finish this. Unfortunately, because of their refusal, and as a group, they refused. And I can see Caleb and, Jay and, and uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb saying, why don't you and I just go over to that promised land and leave these people here, you know? Well, that's not how it works. It was a package deal. And so they were left. You think about it. They were left to wander in the wilderness. What a sad situation. You can say that again. How many people what? How many, how many was the entire nation of Israel? Yeah. Yeah. That's why the book of Numbers is so valuable. Because you can go in there, and like Larry is saying, a lot of times in the Bible what they did was they just numbered the men. You know, it's kind of like, you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 in the Bible in the New Testament? Well, there's an example of it. That was, they were only counting the men. Conservatively, not evangelistically, but conservatively, you can guess there's probably over 10,000 people there that he fed. Five loaves and two fishes. 
Yeah. That's fascinating. But that's why, Dave, that's why the book of Numbers is such a valuable thing. It kind of gives you an idea of what it was. Uh, most theologians estimate, and again, I don't know how good estimates are, they estimate between three and six million people were in the wilderness. I don't know where they get a lot of those estimates, but you know there was a lot of people. There's more than two or three, let's put it that way. And so that was a big crowd, it really was. Good question, these are good questions. Anybody else have a question? point. Excellent point. Excellent point. That, that is so good. That, that is so good. And again, we do. And you want to know one of the reasons we do, Larry? Because our culture teaches us that. This is why we got to quit listening to our culture and start getting back to the Word of God and start listening to what God has to say. And this is what will help us. Now, I understand if she was 90, 95, whatever it was there, you know, she probably wasn't picking them up and putting them down quite like she was when she was 20. But the bottom line is she was doing it. And that's what I've always felt. I've gone to youth conventions, man, and have these you know, these 15 and to, to 25 year old somethings, man, and they're just able to bounce off the walls. Do you think I'm going to imitate that and hurt myself? But I'll guarantee you that's not going to stop me from picking mine up and putting them back down, praise God, and doing my little thing in Jesus' name. We kind of had a similar situation up in Billings, you know, at the conference that night, Friday night service. I mean, she went from, you know, zero to about three, about 150, you know, but a lot of that activity was down in the altar area, and a lot of it was the younger people. But you don't think I didn't dance around that place? You don't think that Brother Sermon and I didn't lock hands, man, and do our thing? Yeah, we didn't look like, we, you know, a bunch of old fools. You know, I don't care what you think of me. I know what God thinks of me in Jesus' name, and so we do it. Good point. That's an excellent point. Okay, we're almost 20 after 8. Um, I have been teaching here for approximately 55 minutes. In most kitchen settings, that's probably about enough. I'm just telling you the truth. You've got to understand, most people are not built, and, and you'll catch a few of them, and sometimes they'll get inspired, but most people, you teach and you present the Word of God for about an hour. That's, that's a pretty good run. It's a pretty good run. Remember what the goal is here, folks. I know I'm teaching the Bible study. But what's the goal? You remember? Yes, every one of you. What would happen to this city if we had 40 to 60 search for truth Bible studies going on at the same time? I'm telling you, we would, God would provide. Yeah, he would. Let's stand tonight. You have been such a good audience, and I, I sense that there's been a lot of receiving here tonight. I really do. I sense that. And that's a good thing. That really is. And, um, and, and I just want a lot of what I want to happen here with me is to get imparted to you. That's what I want. Not that you teach it exactly like I'm teaching it, but to get as calm and as confident in teaching it as me. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not arrogance, folks. That's knowledge. And this didn't happen the first time I taught the Bible study. This happened a few times afterwards. But I believe every one of you can get confident and you can begin to get boldness and God can flow through you like never before in Jesus' name. Now, if you want to pray, that's fine, but I'm going to pray for you in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these people. They're, they're, just, they're really wanting to be used of you, God. I can sense that. 
and there's a bit of fear, sometimes there's a bit of intimidation, whatever it is, I command that to lift, and I command that they'll know and begin to understand the difference in Jesus' name. Strengthen this body of Christians right now. Help them, Lord God, to receive with meekness this engrafted word that's not only to save their soul, but could save thousands and hundreds and, 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 and lots of people in this city in Jesus' name. Raise us up, Lord God, for such a time as this, and I give you the praise and I give you the glory in Jesus' name. What do you say we just thank God? Can we do that together? Oh, 